So I want to talk to you mostly today about Puerto Rico. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a pivotal part of EPA Region 2, and there's a real opportunity for us to make progress on environmental justice. Jean Fox made this a priority during her tenure. This is one of my top priorities. I want to get into detail on four areas. Uh, Caño Martin Pena, the Vieques Superfund site cleanup, uh, recycling, and protecting coral reefs. So um, I was just in Puerto Rico about two weeks ago. Uh, Administrator Gina McCarthy uh, joined me on that trip. She was only the third EPA administrator in our 42-year history to go to Puerto Rico. The others were uh, Lisa Jackson and Christy Todd Whitman. And whenever you go to Puerto Rico, you are struck by the enormous environmental and public health challenges there. There's a lot of interest in Puerto Rico because over a million people that live in New York City are of Puerto Rican descent. In fact, uh, the governor of Puerto Rico calls New York City his largest city. Um, and the challenges are daunting. It's a beautiful Caribbean island. As you know, it relies on tourism as a major source of jobs. I recently met with the um, executive director of the Boys and Girls Club of Puerto Rico. And he educated me and told me that 56% of all children in Puerto Rico live below the poverty line, 56%. More than half of the children in Puerto Rico live below poverty compared to 22% nationwide. I even think 22% of kids living in po poverty is quite stunning. In Puerto Rico, 68% of their electricity comes from burning oil and bunker fuel. Only 1% of the electricity comes from renewables. They have the second highest utility rates in the nation, only behind Hawaii. And unemployment rate is 15%, more than double the unemployment rate in New York and New Jersey. So that sort of just gives you a little context. Um, one of our priorities has been working in communities um, known as Caño Martin Pena. These are eight neighborhoods uh, that surround uh, a filled-in canal, which you see a picture of. Uh, the canal is almost four miles long. It's a tidal channel that goes into San Juan Bay. Over the last 60 or 70 years, people came from all over, not just Puerto Rico, but the Caribbean, and decided to fill in wetlands and create small homes. Um, and lots of debris went into the uh, canal to build their homes. This practice went on for decades. And unfortunately, a lot of the homes were established without modern sewage infrastructure. So there are 3,000 homes and businesses that discharge raw sewage into the canal. This choked canal is, is not maintained at all. And so the 27,000 people who live in these neighborhoods are regularly exposed to sewage polluted water in sediment. We know that the sewage contains lots of pathogens and bacteria. Uh, School-aged children wade home through contaminated flood water after it rains. That photo is typical. It rains in the Caribbean a lot. Uh, children often have to leave school early. Um, I'm really happy that recently Dr. Perry Sheffield and her colleagues at Mount Sinai School of Medicine did a health impact assessment. That's Dr. Sheffield up there. Um, and she did essentially a, a quick health overview of these communities. Intestinal illnesses are higher and people living closer to the canal. Children under five are twice as likely to have asthma than anywhere else in Puerto Rico, because when it floods, everything gets damp and mold is formed. Schools report 50, up to 50% absenteeism during flooding events. And if this is not an environmental justice issue, I don't know what is. And I think as environmental professionals, we have a real opportunity to look at communities like Kenya Martin Pena and others um, all over Region 2 and figure out what we can do to help. We work very closely um, with a community group that's on the ground there called Enlace. We, um, that's Administrator McCarthy uh, on the tour of the Kenya uh, less than two weeks ago. We just happened to stumble upon three of the most adorable little girls in Puerto Rico that just happened to greet the administrator and win over her heart. 
And of course, I framed that photo, and it's now on her desk. Um, <laughs> so we're doing the typical things. We, we just announced a Brownfields grant yesterday. We're looking at the sewage issues. But what this community really needs is four things. One is dredging the canal, fixing the massive sewer problems, improving housing. And all of that is going to take hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, if you want more information on that, give me a call or let's talk after this, this little uh, presentation. Uh, shifting um, over to Vieques, I'm sure you've heard about Vieques. It's about seven miles southeast of mainland Puerto Rico. It was used as a practice bombing range by the Navy and NATO between 1940s and 2003. After lots, and, and that's what the island looks like, pretty beautiful, huh? So after about 60 years of bombing, and strong public protest and community organizing, the military stopped the bombing. But guess what? They left behind a huge amount of unexploded ordnance, bombs and bullets. And guess who's responsible for cleaning it up? The Federal Superfund Program. So two thirds of the island was added to Superfund in 2005. Lots of work going on to remove the munitions. So far, we've removed about 41,000 munitions. So you see that the land is clear cut. And it's so primitive how the military do does removal of these old mu mu munitions. They clear cut the land. And then a trained person goes through and identifies what may be live and what may not be live. And they put multicolor flags on the munitions. It's called mag and flag or something like that. And then some poor guy goes through. And if they don't think it's live, uh, he collects the, the metal by hand in buckets. If they think it is live, they consolidate it all in one pile. And they do a big blow in place because there's not uh, it, there's so much munitions you can't put it in containment chambers. Um, they have not even started removing underwater ordnance, and so that's a big concern for the fishermen and the local community. So um, rest assured, uh, there's a lot of public concern on the island of Vieques, and um, I did I do community meetings down there. Um, I, I did a when I first started EPA, I did a community meeting, and, I, and um, it was it was a really good experience. We always have um, simultaneous translation because I don't speak Spanish; I foolishly took French. Um, so we have this outdoor meeting. We're sitting in a gazebo. It goes on for hours, and I, I have the headphones on, and the. Um, the translator had this very gentle voice. And people were very upset because people from the federal government typically don't show up and say, here's what we're doing. What do you think? Can we get your input before we make decisions? Um, so this meeting went on a long time. And, and this is just the one part I remember is this gentle voice in, in the headphone saying, um, the gentleman believes you are a running imperialist dog and should never return to the island. <laughs> So I said gracias, and uh, <laughs> we went on to, to the next topic. Um, but I think we are, we're slowly winning over some hearts and minds in Vieques, because we're really trying to get this uh, Superfund site cleaned up. Another thing we did is um, Lisa Jackson, our former EPA um, administrator, um, uh, delegated me to be on the President's Task Force on Puerto Rico. So the President's Task Force has um, a spe special focus on Vieques. Out of the White House, we have a Vieques Sustainability Task Force with two goals. One is to clean up the Superfund site, and secondly, to advance sustainable economic development and job creation on Vieques. And I think it's a good example of when Administrator McCarthy, one of her priorities is making a visible difference in communities. That's what we're trying to do here. So the Vieques Sustainability Task Force is focused on um, protecting the bioluminescent bay. Do you guys know what a bioluminescent bay is? I didn't know until I went to Vieques. So basically, you, you swim at night, and it's this isolated bay. And it's like there's these little plankton things, and it's like swimming in stardust. It was amazing, except the, pers the people swimming next to me said they wanted to bring Disney there to make a movie. Um, you can't swim in the bay anymore because um, someone, sharks nibbled on their toes. And so they weren't like seriously hurt, but, um, <laughs> but now you're not allowed to swim in the bay. Um, 
<laughs> but it's a, everyone who goes to Vieques as a tourist, their number one destination is the bioluminescent bay, Mosquito Bay, so you gotta go there. Uh, healthcare is a challenge for residents on Vieques. There's a limited healthcare facility, but if you need dialysis or uh, chemotherapy, you have to take the unreliable ferry off the island. Um, very big, big problems. Uh, energy, they're only using three to seven megawatts of energy on the island, so we have a vision to make that all renewable and energy efficiency. We're working on that. And then, of course, we're working on recycling. So on Vieques and also in all of Puerto Rico. So in 2010, I don't you love that picture? It just, my, my eyes tear up when I see all those recyclables. Um, in 2010, EPA and the central government in Puerto Rico launched the Puerto Rico Recycling Partnership. Our goal is to bring businesses to Puerto Rico that will serve as markets for everything that is collected and creating uh, green jobs in the struggling economy. Now, it may not seem obvious at first, and that's a recycling plant that just opened in Puerto Rico. So it may not seem obvious, but recycling is also a strategy to tackle climate change. Because think about it, new, new materials need to be uh, mined, refined, transported, and manufactured into products consuming enormous amounts of energy and, and emitting greenhouse gases. That's a photo I just took two nights ago um, just outside the EPA office on Reed Street in Manhattan. Uh, there were two guys um, legally loading up a U-Haul truck with cardboard, so of course I stopped and talked to them. They were very nice, and um, they said the reason that they are involved in this is because it keeps them from the unemployment line. And so think of this as an urban forest, okay? This is right near the EPA office in Lower Manhattan. All these businesses bail their cardboard, and these guys come around twice a week and pick it up. It keeps that stuff out of landfills. We know that landfills create methane gas, which is a potent greenhouse gas. And um, we want to see visions of that all over our communities. So the last priority I want to cover in Puerto Rico is coral reefs, because sometimes unexploded ordnance and sewage can get you down, especially after lunch. So um, mm -hmm. something that's really, um, I think, hopeful that we're working on is coral reefs. Um, they have enormous ecological and, and economic purposes that exceed their natural beauty. Uh, anyone who goes to the Caribbean wants to go snorkeling or diving to see the reefs. Uh, they shelter coasts from strong storms, they support fisheries, and they are um, just a support for so many plants and animals we don't even know about. Sadly, we know that coral reefs in the Caribbean are really threatened by climate change, also by overfishing and local pollution. As the ocean temperature rises, the water becomes more acidic and less hospitable to corals. Um, and we also know that as our rainstorms get more intense and more frequent, you get more sediment runoff into the coral beds. So what do we do about it? Um, EPA Region 2 launched something called the Caribbean Coral Reef Partnership. Uh, we, we, we launch a lot of partnerships because uh, we know that uh, we can't do things alone. We want to work in partnership with local uh, and state partners and NGOs and academics. So we established this last year to look at the cumulative effects that climate change was having on coral reefs. So we have these amazingly talented people from Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, and we are, are working really, really hard to address this. So a common thread that weaves through all of our priorities is climate change. Without question, this is our top priority. It's a central part of all of the work that we do. Climate change isn't coming, it is here. The planet's getting warmer. The opportunity to slow it down is fleeting. And in my view, the time to act was yesterday. Uh, the science is clear. Just look at the reports from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, we also know that um, we're just from observational uh, skills, um, that we are already suffering the effects. The 12 hottest years in recorded history have all come in the last 15 years. 2012 was the hottest year ever in the United States, and sea surface temperatures are at the highest level they've ever been since uh, recording of sea, sea surface temperatures began in the 1800s. 
I'm particularly concerned about uh, sea level rise in places like the US Virgin Islands, the Caribbean, the small, small island of Manhattan. Um, if, if, uh, if sea level rise continues, uh, Puerto Rico will see about a 15 inch increase in sea level by 2100. We know that powerful tropical storms are causing coastal erosion, and the Puerto Rico coastline is retreating about three feet every year. Um, so these are, these are really serious, serious issues. We know that we can't say that climate change causes hurricanes and superstorms, but the warmer the water, the more intense the storm. So climate change is not only an environmental issue, it's a huge economic issue. And if you just look at some of the data on Hurricane Sandy, obviously the hurricane caused enormous human suffering and fatalities. In New York and New Jersey, DEP, DEC, EPA were scrambling, particularly the first few weeks. We had large sewage treatment plants that lost power. So the PBSC plant in Newark, one of the largest in the nation, was hit by a storm surge, lost its power. We had raw sewage going right into Newark Bay. Um, there were problems all over the region, Superfund sites, um, drinking water supplies, all threatened. But if you just want to look at the numbers, Superstorm Sandy, one storm, primarily two states, 60 billion in federal tax dollars was presented to the states to do hurricane recovery. So that's not counting the private dollars that were spent. One storm, two states, 60 billion dollars. So for people who argue that we cannot afford to tackle climate change, I maintain that we can't afford not to take action. I strongly urge you to look at the White House website uh, outlining President Obama's uh, climate action plan, which he announced on a hot day in June of 2013. Um, he talked about the need for state and local resources, especially to tackle resiliency. And obviously, we would prefer an international strategy. Uh, for now, we're focusing on a national strategy. The president's plan will reduce carbon pollution. It'll prepare us for the already uh, impacts we're already feeling from climate change. And his goal is to position the, uh, the United States to be a leader in clean energy technology. For the, for the first time ever, EPA will set limits on greenhouse gas emissions. We're focusing on greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases from fossil fuel plants because they're 40% of all greenhouse gas pollution. And you know that EPA has effectively regulated pollutants like mercury, NOx, and SOx from power plants for years. Now we will be doing the same for greenhouse gases. In January of this year, we published regulations to reduce carbon pollution from proposed, not yet built, uh, fossil fuel power plants. And very soon, there will be a proposal dealing with um, carbon emissions from existing power plants. You should watch the news next week. And in q and I'm not going to tell you anything uh, that might be in the reg. Um, so you know, I think this is the first time that we're going to have carbon reduction requirements from fossil fuel plants across the board. Uh, the president's plan has ambitious goals on renewable energy. During his first term, the United States doubled electricity generation from solar and wind, and that plan is to double it again by 2020. So when you talk to people about climate change, when I have conversations with friends and family, um, one of two things happen. Either their eyes glaze over, uh, or it just seems like it's too big a problem for us to really have an impact on. But EPA has successfully regulated other types of pollutants from power plants. Um, remember um, the hole in the ozone layer? Well, it's closing. Remember acid rain, a major issue in the Adirondacks and the Catskills and the Highlands. The United States and Canada took action. Now acid rain is down 65% than when it was in the 1970s. So when it comes to climate change and dealing with fossil fuel pollution, only EPA is in a position to tackle this. 
I think the states and, and local governments have done uh, in some instances, great innovative work. They've been laboratories, but we really need a national approach to this. So working in partnership with states and businesses and NGOs and academics, um, you will see one of the most significant announcements that EPA has made in a generation next week. And it has one goal in mind, and that's protecting future generations. Thank you very much. Okay, we have five minutes for questions. Please make them easy. <laughs> Sir? First, um, uh, thank you and congratulations. But on Puerto Rico, um, just to, to talk about recycling for a second, can you put a little more granularity on that? Because my experience down there is that there's very little going on uh, and there's so much potential. I mean, there's not even a deposit refund uh, law, and, and you know it's, it's pretty obvious what the politics of that are. So, you know, oh, help, help, so help me out. I'm so happy you asked that question. <laughs> so when I first started to go to Puerto Rico for EPA, I'm like, where do I put the recyclables? And I have a lot of New York Times and Diet Pepsi cans in my life. So what I did the first few times is I brought it home in my luggage. Not a good thing. TSA doesn't like it. So um, I said, we've got to start a Puerto Rico recycling partnership. And we did. So we have this great collaboration with the Solid Waste Authority in Puerto Rico, local governments, mayors. And we're, we're, getting, we're getting on our way. A couple communities have recycling. We really have to get it going in San Juan. We need curbside pickup. There is a bottle bill introduced in the Puerto Rico legislature. Uh, the governor supports that. Um, it's, it's slow going, uh, but um, the recycling rate now, they say, is about 10%. I think it's less than that. Um, but ask me that question in a year and then in two years. Um, and we're getting, we're getting companies down there, hint, hint. If any of you represent recycling companies, the sky's the limit in Puerto Rico, not a lot of competition. We're getting companies down there to, um, to receive the material, and we're really pushing hard on composting, uh, yard waste and food waste. And I think, it, um, I, I think it's, it's all going to work out. We just need to keep working hard. Yeah, Sir? I, actually, I worked on the Vieques case when I was at Region 2 EPA in uh, just at the very beginning under, under, I think it was under the Clinton administration. Or, and um, at that time, it was a naval uh, target base. And there was a middle area where people were living and then there were yeah, 8, bombing people either there. ends of the island. Yeah, do you believe it? Yeah, I, well, when I went to the Navy and tried to sit, tell them that the EPA was going to do something to regulate this, they were like, they couldn't believe it. So I'm glad to hear that we've gotten so far on that, but what kind of a, reg, um, of a scheme of cleanup is being employed there? And because uh, the ordinance is all on the ground there, it's, it's a little like Mideast Aluminum in uh, New Jersey. Uh, and we had to come up with a way of, of setting up a pipe or some kind of source that could be regulated. I mean, you have all this ordinance on the ground. What, how do you put limitations on it? Yeah, so I don't know if we can go back to some of the pictures. So what's happening is people are picking them up one by one. And so um, we've removed maybe- well, what about the residues that come out of these? Uh yeah, so there's some soil sampling. There's some chemical uh, cleanup going on. There's a bunch of um, um, operable units. There's a huge amount of work being done by the Navy in cooperation with EPA and the Puerto Rico central government. So you see that picture? So that's a stack of bullets and bombs. Um, and so, and that's me looking at them, sort of surprised. <laughs> like, who's in charge of this? You are. Great. So, um, so if it's live ammunition, it's put in one area and they do a blow in place and, and we monitor air along the perimeter, but it's a huge area. Mm -hmm. And then if it's not live, um, it's recycled. And it's like inch by inch, row by row. I am not gonna start singing a Pete Seeger song, but it is inch by inch, row by row. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first saw this, um, 
Um, Walter Mugden can verify this. I came back and I said, this seems so primitive. There's got to be a better way to do this, but this is it. Mm -hmm. And I think more unexploded ordnance are getting removed at the site than almost anywhere in the country. So um, I think the land is supposed to be done in about 10 years, Walter Wright. And then um, we're really, really put, or less, hopefully less. We're, yeah, we're trying to get into the water. Uh, which is really complicated, divers and mapping. Uh, but that's what a lot, a lot of the local residents, as you mentioned, 8,000 people live there. They said, why don't you start with the water? That's actually what we're concerned about. And my other question, I have one other qu point. Well, when we're, we got to go. We're done. <laughs> well, I have another what an abrupt ending. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks. and businesses and NGOs and academics, um, you will see one of the most significant announcements that EPA has made in a generation next week. And it has one goal in mind, and that's protecting future generations. Thank you very much. Okay, we have five minutes for questions. Please make them easy. <laughs> Sir? First, um, uh, thank you and congratulations. But on Puerto Rico, um, just to, to uh, talk about recycling for a second, can you put a little more granularity on that? Because my experience down there is that there's very little going on uh, and there's so much potential. I mean, there's not even a, a deposit refund uh, law and, and you know it's it's pretty obvious what the politics of that are. So, you know, oh, help, help, so help me out. I'm so happy you asked that question. <laughs> so when I first started to go to Puerto Rico for EPA, I'm like, where do I put the recyclables? And I have a lot of New York Times and Diet Pepsi cans in my life. So what I did the first few times is I brought it home in my luggage. Not a good thing. TSA doesn't like it. So. Um, I said, we've got to start a Puerto Rico recycling partnership, and we did. So we have this great collaboration with the Solid Waste Authority in Puerto Rico, local governments, mayors, and we're, we're, getting, we're getting on our way. A couple communities have recycling. We really have to get it going in San Juan. We need curbside pickup. There is a bottle bill introduced in the Puerto Rico legislature. Uh, the governor supports that. Um, it's, it's slow going, uh, but um, the recycling rate now, is, they say, is about 10%. I think it's less than that. Um, but ask me that question in a year and then in two years. Um, and we're getting, we're getting companies down there, hint, hint. If any of you represent recycling companies, the sky's the limit in Puerto Rico, not a lot of competition. We're getting companies down there to, um, to receive the material, and we're really pushing hard on composting. Uh, yard waste and food waste, and I think it. Um, I, I think it's it's all going to work out. We just need to keep working hard. Yeah, Sir, I, actually, I worked on the Vieques case when I was at Region Two EPA, and uh, just at the very beginning, under under I think it was under the Clinton administration, or and um, at that time, it was a naval uh, target base. And there was a middle area where people were living, and then there were yeah, eight thousand people lived there. Ends of the island. Yeah, do you believe it? Yeah. I, well, when I went to the Navy and tried to sit, tell them that the EPA was going to do something to regulate this, they were like, they couldn't believe it. So I'm glad to hear that we've gotten so far on that. But what kind of a reg, um, of a scheme of cleanup is being employed there? And because uh, the ordinance is all on the ground there, it's, it's a little like mid east aluminum in uh, New Jersey. Uh, and we had to come up with a way of, of setting up a pipe or some kind of source that could be regulated. I mean, you have all this ordinance on the ground. What, how do you put limitations on it? Yeah, so I don't know if we can go back to some of the pictures. So what's happening is people are picking them up one by one. And so um, we've removed maybe. But what about the residues that come out of these? Uh, yeah, so there's some soil sampling. There's some chemical uh, cleanup going on. There's a bunch of um, 
um, operable units. There's a huge amount of work being done by the Navy in cooperation with EPA and the Puerto Rico central government. So you see that picture? So that's a stack of bullets and bombs. Um, and so, and that's me looking at them, sort of surprised. <laughs> like, who's in charge of this? You are. Great. So, um, so if it's live ammunition, it's put in one area and they do a blow in place and, and we monitor air along the perimeter, but it's a huge area. Mm -hmm. And then if it's not live, um, it's recycled. And it's like inch by inch, row by row. I am not going to start singing a Pete Seeger song, but it is inch by inch, row by row. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first saw this, um, um, Walter Mugden can verify this. I came back and I said, this seems so primitive. There's got to be a better way to do this. But this is it. Mm -hmm. And I think more unexploded ordnance are getting removed at this site than almost anywhere in the country. So um, I think the land is supposed to be done in about 10 years, Walter Wright. And then um, we're really, really put, or less, hopefully less. We're, water, as said. Yeah, we're trying to get into the water. Uh, which is really complicated, divers and mapping. Uh, but that's what a lot, a lot of the local residents, as you mentioned, 8,000 people live there. They said, why don't you start with the water? That's actually what we're concerned about. And my other question, I have one other quick point. Well, when we're, we got to go. We're done. <laughs> well, I have another <laughs> an abrupt ending. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>